we're going to go into ultrasounds. Last time we talked about, we continued the whole sound discussion, uh, acoustic diagnostics, talked about cardiovascular sounds, talked about how turbulence makes sounds that you can hear, stethoscope, talked about how density of modulus affects the sound propagation. Um, and so we're going to continue today talking about ultrasound. But first, we're going to talk about something more philosophical. Anyone recognize the concept or the story? Let's say the story that is described in this picture. The allegory of the cave? Yeah, it's the allegory of the cave from Plato. Can you summarize it? Uh, basically, there's like people living in a cave. One of them, like, all they can see is shadows of what goes on outside. Yeah. And then one of them, like, leaves for some reason that none of them left before. And one of them leaves and then comes back and tries to explain what all of these things are. Right. Yeah, so Plato says that Socrates told this story, because that's Plato's motif, is that he is pretending or saying that Socrates told him all these stories, whether or not he did or not. Did but uh, Plato says Socrates told this story about this cave. And in the cave, there's these prisoners that are like, fastened down. They can't move. They can't turn around. And they're forced to look at the wall of the cave. And behind them, there's a fire. And the fire's casting shadows. And then there's people in the cave, for whatever reasons, that are holding up objects. And casting shadows, making a shadow play on the wall. And the prisoners, because that's all they see, they think the shadows are reality because they don't realize it. So the philosophical thing is you need to real, be able to realize what is real and what's just the perception of real and leave the cave and go out to the real objects. But the analogy for us today is uh, when you're looking inside something without cutting it apart, all you have is the perception of reality. You don't have the actual reality. Okay, So that's something critical to realize for materials engineers, for physicians, uh, more than just in the philosophical, everyday kind of application. But for people who are doing imaging studies and doing trying to detect some kind of uh, uh, feature that's important to you, you're not actually seeing the feature because you haven't cut it open. You're seeing the shadow of the feature, or something that represents the feature. So you have to keep that in mind. And so that affects your terminology and how uh, you describe things. And uh, both in non-destructive evaluation and in medical imaging, uh, there's a certain kind of way of organizing your thoughts about this and using words to, and, and terminology to describe it. So first of all, when you are thinking about some kind of imaging study or some, some kind of diagnostic tool, you need to think about what the setting is. What's the background? Why are you doing it? Because this informs everything else that you do down the road. Uh, and so usually when you see a diagnostic report, you're going to see some kind of description of the, the background, why the report was like ordered, either by the engineer or by the physician. So, the reality is, is that all materials have some kind of discontinuity. I don't want to use the word defect in the engineering sense because, or in this terminology sense because it has a specific meaning. Uh, in material science, we talk about defect as saying, oh, crystals have defects, everything has defects, blah, blah, blah. and we don't really mean anything uh, derogatory about that, we're just stating fact. Um, it's less, it doesn't apply as much just to call it a discontinuity because materials aren't always homogenous. There's some kind of heterogeneity. There's something, there's a, a plane or, a, or two different types of materials that are blending each other. An interruption or irregularity or something like that. In the body, you have different tissues. You can have uh, like fibrosis in the middle of an otherwise healthy tissue, things like that. It's not necessarily intentional. And it, it's not necessarily important. It's just the fact. Do we see the discontinuity? No, the discontinuity is the reality. The shadow is what we see unless we cut it open. Without cutting it open, what we, what we have are indications or findings. So if you're doing some kind of imaging study like ultrasound like we're going to talk about today or x-rays, uh, what that report is giving you is an indication or a finding. Indication is really more the engineering term. Finding is really what we use in medicine. It's the same concept. These are the shadows of the reality, okay? Um, when you are describing a discontinuity, with, when you're using the diagnostic study and you have an indication, first of all, you have to realize the indication may not be 
be real. It may not exist. It may be just an artifact of your diagnostic technique. Uh, when you describe it, you should be describe exactly what it is. You don't try to speculate. You don't hedge. Try to avoid hedging. You say exactly what the diagnostic imaging or tool, uh, the diagnostic tool or the imaging study shows you. Just describe exactly that uh, if you're the technician who's running the study. Um, you don't want to use, if there's an apparent uh, or a possible uh, interface at about three centimeters. That's just really not helpful to people. Describe what you can. If you can't describe it, don't go further. Don't guess. I bolded significant. And this is more of a pet peeve in the medical world. The engineers don't do this it's too much. What does significant mean? Anyone take statistics? Significance has, is a statistical term. And anybody who does any kind of experimentation needs to learn a little bit about statistics. Actually, more than just a little bit. But uh, we don't teach this a lot in this engineering department, at least not when I was a student. I had to learn it on my own and then also in medical school. Physicians do it a lot because in clinical trials, you don't have, you have a lot of noise in clinical trials of humans and animals, and, and so you have to run the statistics to actually prove that there's a difference between your two trials. Significance means that you ran the statistics and there is a certain threshold above which that you can say with 95% or 90% confidence that you kind of set the threshold, that you, but usually it's like 90 or 95% confidence that you are not uh, having a null hypothesis. That, that hypothesis, that's the, the statistical language. Null hypothesis means that uh, it wasn't just randomness that caused you to have a difference in your your data. So if you had two groups of data and you're comparing them. Randomness, just random, just as you experiment, you could come up with two different groups, like the averages could be different. Like if you had 10 data points with some condition, 10 data points without some condition, they could, the average could be different between the two. But that could just be random noise that caused the average. It could be out if you did it 100 times each, the averages of the two groups of data could be the same. So what significance means is that there's a 95% chance or whatever the threshold is that, they're, that you're not making that mistake. You're not making a mistake or making a hypothesis. So anyway, people use that in imaging studies in medicine. They say there's no significant uh, no uh, significant lymphadenopathy, for example. Lymphadenopathy or swollen lymph nodes. Okay? That, that's kind of a silly phrase because statistically that it's confusing, so be careful of that. Sorry, that's a little uh, personal thing. Uh, in imaging, when you're reporting the indications, you need to kind of think ahead. You're not making interpretations yet. You're not like deciding what's important yet, but you need to kind of think ahead. Think about the background of why you ordered the study. Enlist uh, negatives. So a negative is a, something that's not there. Well, if you think about looking at something, you can list a lot of things that aren't there, right? If you're really creative, you can list, go to infinity. You have infinite things that are negative. So you only want to list the things that the person who ordered the study would find interesting. So you kind of have to think of the, the, uh, uh, the background. For example, if you're doing, if you're looking at a weld and, and, and you know that it's, well, usually there's gas porosity. But this is the example I'm thinking of. If you know there's no chance that there could be gas porosity in your well, you know the person ordering the study is not going to care if you say no gas porosity or no gas bubbles in it or something like that. That's just going to waste their time. So you kind of have to think about that. I'll give some examples. But the other thing you need to think about is if you have access to prior diagnostics or prior studies, you need to compare. So if there's a chronological progression, So you have the reality, you have the shadow of reality, that's the discontinuity. You have the interpretation of the indication. So the interpretation, or medical terms, sometimes we call them impression, the radiologists use the term impression, is whether or not the indication, the finding on the test, is not, you need to make sure that it's actually reflects reality. It could be completely an artifact of the study, so you have to comment on that. And then you start talking about whether it's relevant or non-relevant. You know, sometimes things are so small, like why even bother talking about it? Uh, 
give some examples about that. Um, usually the interpretation is made by the person performing the study. It gets a little more vague in the engineer world a little bit. In, in medicine, the inter impression is given by the radiologist. Uh, and he kind of interprets the results of the study and puts it into uh, it's kind of the interface between the person, the technologist who or the technician who performed the imaging study and the clinician or the radiologist kind of translates it. Um, you still don't make recommendations at this point. This is just an interpretation of the diagnostic study. Um, now you're to the point where you start thinking about what it means. So take the interpretation and the impression and you make an assessment or evaluation. This is where the clinician who ordered the study takes the radiology report and says, do I need to do something about this? Um, this is also where the engineer will take, like say, an ultrasound testing report and say, okay, they found a certain number of defects in my weld. Do I need to reject the weld? What do I do next? And this can get kind of involved. Uh, I will show you an example. So anyway, at this point, this is where you start labeling the discontinuity or anomaly as something that has a little bit more meaning. This is where you call it a defect or not. If it doesn't meet criteria, if it doesn't fail the spec, it's not really a defect, okay? Um, it's not really a flaw, it's just something that is a, it's kind of a variation in the microstructure, or it's just how the person is, you know, their tissue just happened to be formatted. It doesn't necessarily mean something unless you've done the whole process, done the interpretation and the evaluation, and said, no, this means something, we need to do something about it. And that's when you call it a defect or a flaw or a disorder or a disease. So, this is kind of the hierarchy arranged uh, graphically. You have your indication, that's the shadow. You have the interpretation of the shadow, whether it's false, non-relevant, or relevant. And then you have the person saying, what does it mean? Is it something that I need to do something about? Okay? So an example. Um, my example's not, not the Walter Sands, I apologize for, for my x-rays, but uh, it still applies. So you do an x-ray of a well. This is a gas metal arc bubble, OK? Slide, I think. Okay. So if you look at it with your naked eye, it looks something like this. You've seen wells before, and you have a nice semi circle, looks like a nice well. And it looks pretty good. So you visualize it. That's remember from my first lecture, visualizing first or second lecture. Visualizing is the first thing you do. First second. Thing. Um, and then you do the x-ray and you see this. How would you describe that? As the person making the report. Just just what is the indication? How would you describe it? Yeah, so you got two black areas, right? Anything else about those black areas that might strike you? Yeah, they're kind of, yeah, that's that's yeah. pertinent. And there's kind of an outline. See this right here? It's kind of bright right there. So it's not just a black hole, but it's kind of bright right there. So Dark spots surrounded by light globular areas. So little blobs, it's kind of like a globular thing. That's kind of a sync way. Central would be a good thing to add to that. Um, what's the interpretation? Anyone besides Tom know these things? How would you interpret it? This is burn through. So if you had too much heat at that point, you're at that spot, like you got too close or lingered too long, mm -hmm. and the metal melts and drips out, kind of cavitates. So you make a little cavity, that's the black area. And that white area that was, I was pointing out on the edges, this is called an icicle, it kind of metal kind of drips down. So it's a little bit different. How would you evaluate this? So it depends on your code or standard that you're using your specification. And it depends on your company's procedure and policy and things like that. But you can have pretty uh, involved workflows. So I can't read it, I kind of crammed it all in. So this says, this is an example of a, a, a spec kind of found. For their non-destructive testing, they take 5% of the wells from a particular well room, and they get x-rays. If there are all acceptable, then you can stop. If one well is accepted, 
but one weld is rejected and has some kind of defect that doesn't meet code, then you have to do an x-ray with two more welds. If they're okay, you can accept a lot. If not, then if either of those welds are rejected, then you have to go and do the whole lot, like all the guys' welds. So you don't really want to do that, so that's why you're trying to avoid doing that, but that's the last resort, right? And then similar tree this way. So they have these algorithms for whether or not they can accept. They're trying to avoid testing every single weld, right? And so they're, again, this is a, theoretically it's important by statistics and the probabilities of having the defect. So, third statistics, I, I didn't put that in my conclusions, but I'll say that right now. All right, here's another example from medicine. And this is arranged in how a radiologist would report a CAT scan. So first they give uh, the procedure, CAT scan with contrast. I'll talk about contrast next week. Uh, the background is very succinct. You got a 59 year old woman who had congestion. That's the part of the presentation, and she had an opacity on an x ray. And so they're doing a CAT scan. Uh, talk about the technique that they're using. They have that other chest x ray they won't compare it to. So that's the history. So this is the findings. How would you describe this? That's not me. Okay, first let me lay things out for you because not everyone's seen a CAT scan. So in uh, medical imaging, there's a standard uh, orientation to how you present all images. So we call it the anatomical position. You're looking at this person as if you're looking from their feet, as if they're laying on their back, and you're looking from their feet to their head. Like you're standing at the foot of their bed, as it were, and they're laying on their back, and you slice them like a loaf of bread. So this is a slice through the person's thorax. And you're looking at that slice as if the person's still like a loaf of bread laying on the back in the bed, you're at the foot of the bed looking from the feet to their head, and you're looking just at the slice that goes through the, the thorax, okay? So that means, if I'm laying like this, where's the right of the patient? Exactly. So, no, that's not true. I got confused there. Where's the right of the patient? So here. Yeah, 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 the right of the patient. Not what is right of the patient, but what's the patient's right, I should say. So, yeah, this is my left, this is my right. So this is the right side of the patient, that's the left side of the patient. We'll at the so this is the backbone. You see that there, spinal column, or spinal canal? You got one of the thoracic vertebrae. You got white ribs going through there. The contrast on the ribs isn't they haven't windowed the contrast in a way so that you can see the bones compared to the soft tissue very well because they're trying to look at long. So this is one. Dark because it's air. It doesn't attenuate the x-rays like bone and even soft tissue does. Up there is your breastbone. So this is the top of the heart. This is where the bronchi divide from the trachea. So this is right where it starts to run. So it's the two main bronchi going to the lung. These are blood vessels going through the lung. They're white because they gave them contrast, which is a radio-opaque material that absorbs x-rays, and so it's kind of like bone, but in blood vessels. It's your big, big aorta. White because there's contrast going through it. So, when you're looking at a radiographic image, medicine, you actually kind of think like material science, scientist, because you start thinking about symmetry. Because we kind of have a two-fold symmetry in the human body, kind of. So you look at that and you're like, well, I recognize the general shape of the heart. It looks pretty normal. But there's something that looks wrong symmetrically, right? So over on the left side, over here, there's this what we call opacity. So this, this, this right here, it's not a good sign. So um, that's the first thing that jumps out. But you know how I talk about pertinent negatives? Radiologists has to do a lot more pertinent negatives than maybe uh, you'd see in the engineering world. So uh, they describe that map area as a diffuse, because it's kind of spread out, but still dense, which kind of in material science terms doesn't make sense, but in other terms, Airspace opacity occupying most of the left upper lobe 
with uh, Air Blanco Brands. Just um, and he points out that it's new since the prior examination. Uh, and then he starts talking about uh, uses of permanent negatives. The parenchyma is just the material of the tissue. It's the part of the tissue that actually does the work. Technically, what parenchyma is, because there's lots of a good part of any kind of organ that is just structural tissue. Right? It doesn't actually do any metabolic work. So parenchyma is the metabolic work, uh, basically. Uh, he does comment, I didn't point this out earlier, but there's, this is called pleural fluid. So you remember last week I talked about pleura, which is the lining of the organ. So you have pleura of one, pleura of the, uh, of the chest wall. In between, there's some fluid collected. That's not uncommon in this condition. It's not excessive. You see it sometimes in more or less healthy people, but uh, maybe not that much. He mentions that the heart, pericardium is the area around the heart. Are normal. Uh, mentions that uh, trachea and bronchi are normal. And actually, adds in this comment that there's no lesion in the, the either in the esophagus or in the trachea, which we'll talk about. Also, mentions that he doesn't really see, he or she, whoever it is, uh, see uh, large lymph nodes. In radiologic terms, they kind of care about lymph nodes that are bigger than the center. It's kind of they talk about there's some rules for where is the body and where the rest. It's kind of complicated. But that's why he mentions the largest is nine millimeters. It's still not quite a centimeter. And then he throws in the comment about like there may be some degenerative changes. Of, that just means the person getting older. So this is the conclusions. This is the impressions. The radiologist interpreted those indications. Okay? So sometimes. You don't really know what the indications mean, so you don't want, he's kind of hedging a little bit by saying most compatible with pneumonia. But he's doing that, in the, medical, in the medical world, he does that to kind of leave the clinician some leeway, the person who actually has to do something about the patient. So sometimes you see this in radiology. But uh, uh, they comment again on the lymph adenopathy, this whole, whether or not there's swollen lymph nodes. The reason for that is, I'll make you guess, is he's ruling out cancer. So he's thinking ahead of what the clinician's going to decide to do. And so he's kind of given the, the, the like, the, the clinician who ordered the study would be like, say, a primary care physician who saw the patient come to his office coughing up a bunch of nasty stuff. Right? And so ordered this testing. So he's going to read this and go, oh, no big lymph nodes. Oh, that's pretty good. Uh, this means it's probably not cancer. Yeah. So will the uh, physician typically go back and review the scans from whether sure. whatever imaging platform, or how much weight are they putting blindly on what they're getting in this report versus? You want to hear the should or what happens? They both. Okay. They should review. So, uh, and if they have any questions about the radiologist's report or about something they see on this imaging study that isn't explained in the report. They should talk to the radiologist. And so the radiologist is working for the people who work the study. They're not really working for the patient. I mean, they, they care about the patient, but in a business sense, they're really working for the person who ordered the study. So they're, they're clients of other physicians, and, and if you think about it. And so uh, as the ordering physician, you really need to feel comfortable about, about that. If you have any kind of questions, contact the radiologist. Some radiologists are better than others at returning your page or your phone call. Um, I once saw a study where uh, we saw these soft tissue densities in a CAT scan that was ordered for a patient who was coughing. And the radiologist report really only commented on uh, the status of the person's lungs. They didn't really say much. They said the lungs look pretty good. And I'm looking at the CAT scan, and I'm like thinking, I don't care about the lungs. I care about all this junk that's like growing into the person's chest wall. The radiologist didn't comment on it at all. So had I just looked at the report, I would have told the patient, oh, I don't really know what's going on with you. 
you have these vague symptoms, and we looked at your CAT scan, or we looked at the CAT scan report, and it said it was fine, and we sent the person home. Unfortunately for this patient, uh, what I saw in the soft tissue, after reviewing it with, first I called up the, there was a radiologist in another town. I called up this that practice, and I was partner on the phone, and got him to talk about that, uh, the report. Fortunately, because I didn't get the guy who read the report, the guy who I talked to just kind of said what he saw and couldn't really comment on why his partner didn't report the stuff that I was seeing. But he confirmed my suspicions that it was abnormal. At least, you know, I'm not, I wasn't a radiologist, so I couldn't really say that. But then I went to talk to the radiologist in my facility and showed him. I brought the, so there's a standard uh, electronic format nowadays called DICOM even if you don't have the particular software that they use to open up the DICOM, you can still take the DICOM and all the images. You can look at the images somehow. And so ideally if a patient shows up, they should bring the actual images with them if it wasn't done in your facility. If it's not your facility, usually you can get access to the images and it or something. So I went and talked to our radiologists and they're all, yeah, yeah, it's, this is next time cancer. So that, that person uh, had a recurrence of cancer uh, that we had thought she we thought she'd been cured of it, but it, there was no sign of it for years, and it was a type of cancer that doesn't really metastasize like this. So it was actually kind of surprising, unfortunately, because it went past. So, um, so yeah, not to tell an example where I actually looked at the imaging study. There's probably a couple stories I, if I thought about it, I could probably find a story where I did look at the imaging study when off the report got burned. Um, but yeah, you should always look at the imaging study. And that's probably true for engineering too. You should try to look at the study yourself, even if you don't understand all the nuances. So, is there an issue too with it being like a fairly qualitative and like operator dependent process, uh, or is operator it this dependent? Yeah, there's also patient variation. Uh, you might see the phrase "large habitus." In a lot of imaging reports, which means the person has a lot of soft tissue around their body, it's hard to like image them, or they, they might say uh, limited by patient movement. So, like, as you go with MRIs, person, like, whatever you're studying has to hold still <clears throat> because you get a lot of really weird blurry artifact. In a CAT scan, it happens fast enough, x rays move at the speed of light, right? So, even if someone moves a little bit, at least with that, within a particular slice, you're not going to get blurry. But the MRI doesn't really work like that. And so, Movement and what you think is just a leg can affect a lot. So, <clears throat> so at any rate, there's things like that, and then uh, different machines do have different uh, resolutions or slice thicknesses or different procedures that work for a certain machine. So that's why at the beginning, uh, oops, what's the button? There, it talks about technique. So an astute physician may look at that and may care about certain. You'd have to be pretty astute to know like the slice thickness. It says high resolution. I, I know when you're doing CT with contrast, they do a little bit better resolution than other types of CAT scan studies. But um, I couldn't tell you right now off the top of my head. It's probably three millimeter slices. Um, yeah. First of all, an average person who has never looked at these things is not going to see the same things. If you've got experience, like you saw the plural stuff, yeah. I didn't even notice that because I'm not used to looking at long. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my favorite story on this is there was they were building a pipeline in Australia. They had two diff different manufacturers of steel, and they have to X-ray every one of these welds. And for whatever reason, without going into the details, one manufacturer of pipe got a bad rep with the X-ray readers. Okay. And they were they were canceling ninety they were rejecting ninety percent of the wells. Well, afterwards, there's a big flap and everything about whether the steel was any good. And they had a blind study, so they had X-rayers review all the wells, and no one could tell the difference. Okay, so sometimes there's a lot of subjectivity into these things. Okay, people don't you're dealing with a human reading something. Okay, and so should as Neil said. Yes, the professional doing it should read it. I don't care if you're an engineer looking at a weld or you're a physician looking at a patient. 
you're the one getting paid the big bucks. You're the one where the buck stops. Yeah, the person who makes the clinical decisions for the evaluation level, they need to be confident that they need to feel good about the report. And the only way to feel good about something is double check it yourself. So, um, but yeah, as far as the subjectivity of reading, that comes from experience. It comes from training and more of a practice level or type of training. Again, with engineering, you kind of learn concepts and then we send you off and take those concepts and you can extrapolate them to all these different real world problems that you've never seen before. But you know the basic physical concepts and you can extrapolate and it's great. Uh, it gives you lots of flexibility and freedom. Uh, but when the physical concepts don't make it, when the problem that you're dealing with isn't uh, uniform enough that you can predict based off of physical concepts, you just have to learn from experience. You have to see hundreds and hundreds of situations and talk to people who have uh, experience and see what they think. Um, the analogy, my, before I went to med school, I was into rock climbing. And I don't know if anyone's rock climbing, but rock climbs are rated. They have a certain rating. And uh, it's kind of an art, this kind of silly rating system. It's not what you would predict would be. But, uh, uh, but it's given a number. And the higher number, roughly, the harder the climb. And <clears throat> when I first started, I'd be like, well, someone said this was an easy climb. They called it a 5 4. That's easier than a 5 6. So I guess I'll do the 5-4 because I'm starting now. But if you ask me if I tried both of them, I might think that the 5-4 was easier than the 5-6, but I couldn't have ever told you that it was not a 5 Like, if I did the 5-6, I couldn't have told you whether it was a 5-5 or a 5-7. I just knew it was harder than the 5-4, right? But with some experience, after a while, I just started saying, ah, oh, without knowing what other people call it, I just started saying, well, that was a 5-7. Sure enough, that's what other people call it, too. It's just something that you kind of learn <laughs> so uh, back to the CAT scan, uh, these are the impressions, and then if I was the clinician and I got the impressions from the radiologist, I would make my assessment and say, this person's got pneumonia, it's low bar, meaning it's just from one low uh, person got it, they weren't in the hospital when they got there, they were at home, so you call it community acquired. So it's most likely, it's like 90% of the time caused by streptococcus pneumonia uh, and community acquired low bar pneumonia. And so what you do about that, that's the next step. You make a plan. Um, this will go beyond the imaging part, but like, uh, you know, if you order a study, you need to do something. So, we inquire them on you, you start them on uh, antibodies, call that empirically because you don't have proof that they have a particular bacteria, but in this case, like I said, it's like 90% of the time, structure structure Start them on a macro lab, like I said, nice. If they meet certain criteria uh, that cause you concern for them, to survive this pneumonia, you would hospitalize them. Otherwise, pneumonia now is sent back home for like, this would be like five days of antibiotics. Uh, so here, let's talk about this. Um, so, kind of know these things already, but it's based off of the fact that the velocity of sound uh, is dependent on medium, duh. Uh, sound scattered by discontinuities, so that's why it works. Um, it's not inaudible, which is pleasant. It's kind of the definition. Ultrasound is too high of a frequency for you to hear. Um, if you do it right, you don't hurt the person or the material that you're examining. If you do it wrong, you can heat up the material, which actually is a good thing if for people doing physical therapy. I've had ultrasound on my back for some back strain, something like that. Basically, it's just a way to focus heat. Um, if you do it really wrong, you can actually cause the water, because your sound waves are cause perturbations in the water and the water can't keep up and cause cavitations to form, so little voids in the water. You can imagine that's kind of bad for biological things. It doesn't really happen in uh, like metals, but in a panel that would not be good. So the history, real quick. The Curies did a lot of stuff besides just x-rays. And what one thing that Pierre Curie uh, did was he first talked about is electricity. So, uh, which is critical, I'll explain why. Some context, in 1912, the Titanic sank, and so suddenly people start trying to start detecting icebergs, and they said, hey, what about doing it like the whales do? So they start, that's when sonar started getting involved. 
and then World War I broke out. And so now they're, everyone was concerned about German subs. And so they started working on trying to take German subs. So Longevin was a student of Curie and uh, decided he could make ultrasonic waves by, uh, with a piece of electric material. So he put quartz between some steel plates, boom. Uh, and uh, he discovered submarines and killed fish. Um, <coughs> Soviet became very involved in the research. He actually did all theoretical first and published on it. It's kind of classic Russian kind of thing. But, uh, uh, but he was the first to like talk about looking for flaws in materials. And, uh, and then the Germans, this is getting into the World War II period, they got involved and they uh, first uh, Started, they were the first ones to start getting images. So Muehlhauser, the way he got images, he had the material, he had a transducer on one side, transmitting, and a receiver on the other side of the material. But uh, his contemporary colleague, Holman, he decided that it was kind of hard to aim up two different transducers, so he developed a different way to kind of uh, receive signal. He took a flask full of xylene, filled it up with aluminum flakes, and put a material above it, and then the transducer above that, and as the acoustic waves went through the material, where there was a defect, it would change how the aluminum flakes would per perturbate inside this flask, and you could actually see that. So he kind of scanned the material through, and where the aluminum flakes changed, how they moved. Uh, he'd say, oh, that's a defect. That was important in develop developing ammunition for flak. Def like, so flak, so we shoot up at airplanes so that they fly into, and they get hurt so they can't bomb them. They bomb a lot. He is also one of the first people to use it for medical reasons, but for physical therapy. Um, guy with an awesome name, Floyd Firestone, was one of the first U.S. developers of ultrasound. Um, he came up with a brilliant idea. Instead of trying to use a transmitter and aim it at a receiver and make sure the, the waves match up, it was kind of complicated. He said, what if I just let the wave go into the material hit the back side of the material and bounce back and use that signal to detect, detect things. And that's essentially what we do today. We don't use a transmitter or signal most times. Um, and then he also developed pulsing as opposed to continuous ultrasound. And then throughout the 40s, it basically wasn't really used. It was under development. Um, they, they didn't use it for medical diagnostics. They were using it for medical therapy. It was kind of like, hey, let's try to treat whatever we can. And there was a lot of snake oil being uh, at that time. Although cancer therapy, we still use ultrasound cancer therapy. You can actually focus a lot of energy up to the point where you get to water captation, but you can do it just to the focal point and destroy cancer cells. So anyway, this is a picture of the sort of the time period of someone finding defects with one of the early ultrasound techniques. And it doesn't look that much different than this. So the transducer, you have a screen here to look at. And I'll show you a picture of what this shows you. Okay, so that's doesn't look that much different, right? For medical diagnostics, is really a neurologist in Austria who was the first one. He was trying to detect brain tumors. I don't know how successful he was because really ultrasound's not used anymore for anything in the brain because we're talking about why bone is problematic. But he was one of the first uh, to use it medically. Uh, throughout the 40s and the 50s, more people got involved. There was a guy named Douglas Howry, who apparently in his garage, I don't know, what I, when I read this, I said, in his garage? Maybe he was doing electronic development, but he also did a lot of correlation with the gross anatomy. And I've heard of gross anatomists taking their work home with them. I had a friend in med school whose dad was a neuroanatomist, and uh, he'd come home and find brains in the refrigerator. But I don't know if this is what this guy was doing, but apparently he was a garage inventor. Um, and uh, this is the type of size of equipment that you're dealing with. People would send these tubs. I'll talk about why in a little bit. Um, tubs of water. The equipment was huge. Why was it huge in the 50s? Vacuum tubes. Yeah, you didn't have transistors. Um, so I mentioned that. So 47, you had the first transistor. Then you had integrated circuit in 1958. And then uh, ultrasound development really took off. 
Um, so the physics, uh, like you mentioned, all sounds above the acoustic range, acoustic range like 20 to hertz, 20 kilohertz. Um, so we're talking like megahertz, maybe in other terms, maybe up to 10, that'd be pretty high. You can get up to uh, 20 megahertz in diagnostic for materials. Um, so the velocity is wavelength times frequency, right? It also varies with uh, the modulus and the density. We talked about that. So for a given frequency, you can say the wavelength varies with the material. The attenuation also varies with the material. So the density of the material, the higher the modulus, the wave attenuates more, which means it dies down, or the intensity dies down faster as you go through this point through the thickness of the material. Um, because of these properties, you can detect where the material, where there's a difference in material properties. So you can see where there's interfaces or defects. Um, we call it echoes if there's a big difference between the materials. So if you had something particularly dense or stiff deep to the material, and you had your signal go through and hit that, you wouldn't really see anything behind it because it'd make like a shadow. But you would get an echo back from what you're hitting. Um, so it kind of limits the study if you have something particularly dense there because you can't really see behind that. I'll show you down. So these are various different materials properties, uh, or these are various materials with their densities, and I kind of cheated. These are bulk modulus, and for solids, it's not really the bulk modulus you care about. We talked about that a couple lectures ago. But this is just more for comparison reasons. And uh, for the most part, the speed of the sound and material kind of goes with the density. But you can see in some cases where the density doesn't vary a lot, but the modulus varies a fair amount, and that affects the speed. Like, compare bone and water. Bone's not that much denser than water, surprisingly enough, right? Because it's not a solid solid. It's got a lot of porosity, which blood's going through. Blood's like water, right? So, but uh, its modulus is much higher. So it changes the speed of sound a lot. So where you, <clears throat> um, oil, let's transform oil, but it's kind of similar to fat. So, uh, fats. Oil floats on water, right? Fat floats. So that makes a difference in imaging humans. So what does this mean? Interfaces stop sound. Like where there's an interface between drastically different materials, really, it's really hard to make an image uh, past that interface because uh, if you're given enough energy to get through the material, I would say this. Like, if you have bone and soft tissue, if you give enough energy to go through the bone, you're not really going to see the soft tissue. If you use the optimum frequency and energy to go through the soft tissue, then it gets reflected by the bone, so you can't see past the bone. So air interfaces are kind of the limit, like absolute, you can't see past the air interface. So that's why you get reflections back off the backside of the piece that you're looking at. Um, so in the body, if I said that you can't see past the bone, and you have air interfaces, so air and bone are kind of the limiting things. Everything in between is soft tissue. And I just showed you the, the table where oil and water, its density is about one gram per centimeter, a right? cubic centimeter, right? A little less for oil, not that much less. So why does ultrasound work in the body? What changes? It's the modulus that changes. That's, that's affecting the speed of the sound. And so different tissues have different amounts of collagen, some other things that make stiffer. Scar tissue, you felt scar tissue on your arm, right? It's stiffer than the rest of the skin. So that affects how ultrasounds uh, creates images. Um, inflammation tends to make fibrosis, that's essentially scarring inside the body. So you can see where the inflammation has been. You can see cancer, you can see dead material because dead cells will kind of store up calcium and they make little calcium deposits. So cancer cells or dead cells uh, kind of leave an eye base. Uh, calcium deposits that you can then see on the So that's kind of what I was trying to describe. So you have different uh, arrangements for the transfer and receiver, but the top one's really what most uh, of the setups are like. So you're sending out a signal, uh, either bounces off a defect or bounces off the back wall 
or a significant interface, like say where Bowman is, and comes back to the receiver. And so you get your signal. This is what this would show. This is really simplistic. This is a linear 1D kind of signal. You get your initial pulse, and you might get a little signal for your echo defect, and then you get the echo, or the echo of the defect, and then you get the echo bouncing off the back wall. Pretty simple. So you can kind of measure depth if you time things right. So you can kind of figure out what, how deep something is. Kind of hard using the system to measure the size. It doesn't really tell you, right? It's just one D. It doesn't tell you much about the size. Um, so these, the transducer on this is still a piezoelectric. So there's the transducer. Um, like alpha quartz, pretty common. More common is uh, lead, uh, zirconate. Uh, um, the characteristics of piezoelectrics, so you have some piezoelectric coefficients related to, that relates the electric field to the stress or strain. So if you strain a piezoelectric, it produces electricity, right? And the coefficient alpha is the, how much electricity is created from that strain. So something with a high alpha would be a good transfer. Right? Strained a little. High alpha means a lot of electrical signal comes out. Great transmitter. <clears throat> if you have an electric field hit a piezoelectric, they'll stress the material. And how much it stresses, it depends on this beta coefficient, right? And so for a receiver, you want something that a little electric field cause a big stress. So a big beta is good for a receiver, right? The issue is, is because stress strain relationships, you're a material scientist, I don't have to explain this. Uh, that means you have a relationship between alpha and beta. So one over alpha beta, alpha, one over alpha times beta is equivalent to the Young's modulus. Which means something with a high alpha won't have a high beta as well. It's kind of hard to find something that has both high alpha and high beta. Which means uh, it's kind of hard to have a transmission, have a material that's both a good transmitter and a good receiver. So the solution for that is use two different materials, or use something that's good enough, which is what the lead, circuit titanium, titanium, PZT5, or PZT5, yeah, is, it works good. Hold on. So what I described before, just showing those peaks, that was called A mode, or amplitude mode. You've seen the amplitude of the sound bouncing around. Uh, so they develop imaging, they call it B mode, because of brightness mode, which is brightness off the screen, it's kind of silly to call it. Essentially it's 2D. Then you just get it from rastering, so you can just raster across with your, so you just kind of go like a TV, like old school TV. Um, but nowadays they have phased arrays where you have several transducers in a row, and you get the same effect. Uh, and it produces signal kind of like if you had a, imagine a, your transducer, the transmitter at the top of your screen, and it's sending the signal down to the bottom of the screen, and bounce them back, and when it bounces back, it can tell from uh, the amplitude how strong it comes back, and so it colors a cell, well, it, it, it knows how fast it comes back. And so when it takes a long time to come back, it knows it's down here as opposed to up there. So it picks what cell to fill in based off from the echo delay. And then the strength of the signal tells it how much of a difference of material there is there. So that tells it how to color the cell. So the strength of the signal tells you whether to make it white versus gray versus dark. This would be low signal, strong, I mean low amplitude, strong amplitude of the echo. And this would be how fast it comes back. It comes back fast or it's close to the surface. That's how you make imaging from the Uh, a couple things. I mentioned the water in the tub. Don't be trying to remove the air mount because the air is hard to get sound through, right? So surround the person with water, have the transducer in the water, or a gel. Like medical ultrasound usually use like KY jelly or something like that. And it reduces friction as you move it around. It's usually not too messy. Um, that's called a couplet. Uh, you can focus the wave in various different ways. You can detect the Doppler effect on things that are moving, like red blood cells are moving. And so the sound's going to bounce off them, and you're going to get a Doppler effect. And so you can get velocity data using ultrasound. 
and uh, you can stick a, now the transistors are small enough, you can stick them on the thing and then just copy fiber optic and uh, do pulse sound from the inside out. So, some examples, and then we'll finish. Closest status is the inflammation of the gallbladder. We talked about the gallbladder, the green stuff, and we saw the picture of the liver and the gallbladder is green. But you can get an inflammation there. And so, this is what a normal gallbladder draw shell looks like because this is just fluid in there. This is your gallbladder. Um, your liver's kind of around there. This is what happens when you get some flame. That's got cholecystitis means, itis means inflammation. Chole is Latin for the Latin term that we use for gallbladder. And so, the inflammation change the collagen of the gallbladder surface. There's fluid collecting, there's gunk that's kind of filled up that's not just pure liquid anymore. And so that's what you're seeing there. So uh, that was a way to detect cholecystitis. Speaking of livers, you can see the infection. That's what an abscess is, a pocket of infection bacteria growing in there. There's liquid in there making it darker than the, the liver. You can see these calcified bladder stones. This is a big bladder full of urine. That's why it's dark, surrounded by soft tissue, and there's these stones. And uh, if you have a person moved, you can see the stones bouncing around. I don't have a video of that, but it's kind of, kind of cool when you see stones bouncing around live. Uh, this is an inter uterine device to prevent pregnancy. So this is the uterus right here. This is the inside of the uterus. This is the uterine stripe, and then this is the very dense compared to the rest of the body. Uh, I mean, it's just a polymer, but it's denser than the human body. Uh, you can use an ultrasound to make sure the uterine device, the inner uterine device is in the right spot, sometimes in the or something. Um, over here, people talk about a ruptured spleen. They were playing football and got a ruptured spleen. Uh, well, you know, the spleen has a lot of blood flowing through it. It's kind of, in a way, one of the body's filters. And uh, so it's, if it pops a leak, it can leak a lot. So it's kind of bad. So this is a hematoma in the spleen. <clears throat> you de detect breast cancer with ultrasound. Usually they do mammograms and they'll kind of confirm with ultrasound. They can also sample, uh, use ultrasound to kind of uh, localize uh, where to get a sample, to get a tissue sample. Um, so that's an example of that circular area is a uh, cancer growing in the breast tissue. This is the Doppler that I was talking about. So we discussed hearing carotid stenosis, hearing the turbulence. This is actually quantifying it. So this is normal. So this is a nice flow going through your carotid artery, right? This is another person's carotid artery, and the flow is much less than the blue is not, not is indicating much slower blood. So that's 50 to 70 percent. Uh, stenosis. So you can quantify what a physician might hear. So nowadays, someone listens to a carotid artery and go, Ooh, I think I hear a carotid worry, send them to the ultrasound, and they quantify. So when I talk about 50 or 90% stenosis, you can't hear anything anymore. These numbers come from this. Cardiac, cardiac tamponade is when blood collects in, within the pleural lining, between the pleural lining pericardial lining and the heart itself. You know, really deep for some reason, the blood you know, collects there. There's only so much room inside the pericardium for the blood to collect, and so it starts exerting pressure on the heart. The heart doesn't mean so kind of a dangerous thing to have happen to you. And so uh, they developed ways where you, this is the ultrasound being pointed kind of right here, up towards the bottom of the heart. And so this is a cross section of the heart. Again, the person laying down, you kind of come through, you kind of looking up, you see. The left ventricle, the left atrium, the right atrium, and the life. Not good. And then, what everyone is kind of familiar with is fetal ultrasounds. Uh, I talked about the Doppler. There's a simpler ultrasound, ultrasound probe that you use with pregnant mothers uh, just to detect fetal heart rates. Um, but it's just, it's just a simple probe to the, the, the Doppler. Hear the baby's heartbeat. So, remember, discontinuities are not the same as indications or interpretations or evaluations. They're kind of all separate things. You have to go through it in a systematic way. Uh, 
density modules change 10 sounds, so therefore you can cut material interfaces. And finally, what you didn't write, go learn some stats. It will be good for you. And next time, we'll talk about x-rays. Sorry, going a little over.